unable to rise any higher. Irene would carry her bow, her footsteps the only sound. The world prehistoric, wind shifting the snow like sand, small dunes and hollows, the water close beneath. Irene imagined herself not properly dressed for the cold for some reason, wearing what she had worn inside the cabin, finished now, a blue sweater, thin down vest, wool pants and boots, a knit cap, white and gray, no gloves. Her hand holding the bow was cold. She walked toward the glacier, toward the mountains, away from the island, walked slowly, then stopped and looked around. Without her footsteps, no sound, no wind, no moving water, no bird, no other human. This bright world, the sound of her heart, the sound of her own breath, the sound of her own blood in her temples, those were all she would hear. If she could make those stop, she could hear the world. The water beneath her was moving, and that must make a sound. A dark current beneath ice, no surface to break, no ripples, but even that must make a sound. Deep water, layers and currents, and when one layer moved over another, something must hear that, some carrying of water against water. And over time, the changes in those currents, the shifts, the lake never the same from moment to moment, all that must be recorded somehow. Irene could imagine herself continuing on over the thin crust, holding the bow, she's a bow hunter, in her left hand, letting the other hand warm in her pocket, continuing over light dunes of snow, pausing in an area of large flakes, the size of fingernails, individual snowflakes, their branches visible, lying at angles, razor thin. They looked ornamental, contrived, too large and individual to be real. She squatted down for a closer look, touched a flake, then wiped her hand over the surface, across the surface, revealing the black of the lake the color of ice over the depths, a vacuum of light, and no way to peer into it, the surface clear, but so dark as to be essentially opaque. And I'll, I'll stop there on that. The, um, uh, if you can hear, there's a lot of paired stresses, like a, a bright world, without her footsteps, no sound, no wind, no, wind, no bird. Um, and, and that's because the, Gary, the, her husband, is a failed Anglo-Saxonist, a failed academic who was studying Old English poetry, which is what I really love. I, I read in Old English. So it's, it's the English that we had a thousand years ago before the French invaded and our language became half French and half German. And it, it, it uses these kind of uh, clumps of content with all the grammar cut out. So to hear what it sounds, it sounds like Theod König, Thrym Jö Thrym, Hutha Eitlingas, Ellen Fremida. And I like that, that kind of rhythm. And it seems to me that it fits the Alaskan landscape in some way. Because there's something a little harsh and brutal about, about Alaska if you're stuck out in it and things aren't going right. Um, and so I, I liked, I liked that, those kind of paired stresses and cutting away some of the grammar. It uses a lot of sentence fragments without verbs, for instance. Um, and I, I liked doing that. I felt like it fit, it fit the place. Um, but just see, it, it sounds completely different than, than Legend of the Suicide.